Section 4.3 is kind of a doozy, so just stick it out with me. We're finding trig for any angles. Now a couple of pieces of vocabulary to talk about. When we have positive angles, we're going in the counterclockwise direction, which makes sense, it's what we did last time. So counterclockwise is positive. And if we're measuring a negative angle, then that's clockwise. So we're going the opposite direction, or clockwise. That's a negative angle. So to be able to do trig for any angle, we're gonna need to be able to sketch angles in standard position. So if we zoom in on this first example, 210 degrees, we need to figure out how to graph it because we're gonna need to know what coordinate each of these angles appears in eventually. So what I remember about this is that this angle is zero degrees and 360 degrees. This angle is 90 degrees, and this angle is 180 degrees, and this is 270 degrees. Right, so all of my four corners of this, my positive x, positive y, negative x, and negative y, have different angle measurements. So if I know I'm looking for 210, I know that that has to be a little bit beyond 180, specifically 30 degrees beyond 180. So it's in quadrant 3, and then this angle in green would be 210 degrees, 30 degrees past 180. If I was doing negative 210 degrees, again, I would have to kind of do my angles in a certain way. Specifically, I want to look at 0, negative 90, negative 180, and negative 270. Since I'm going in the negative direction, those are the easy 90 degree angles to look at. Again, I know that 210 is a little bit, I guess I should say 210 degrees, let's be more specific here, is a little bit beyond 180 degrees specifically 30 degrees beyond 180. So we're going this direction. Whoop. That's negative 210 degrees. 30, negative 30 degrees beyond negative 180. And we can do the same thing in radians. Now a lot of times students are going to be super confused when it comes to radians because we're just not used to it. So if push comes to stuff, transform these back into degrees and you can do it that way. But we need to be able to talk about radian measurements a little bit more clearly. So if we want to graph 3 pi over 4, we need to know the references in degrees. The references that we know in degrees, we need to write them in radians. So this is still 0 radians. 90 degrees is pi over 2. 180 degrees is pi. We have 3 pi over 2, because that's pi over 2 plus pi. And all the way back to 2 pi. It's our 360 degree. So if we want to write something with a denominator of 4, 3 pi over 4, I find it helpful to change all of your 90 degree measurements, your 2 pi degree measurements, 2 pi degree, 2 pi radian measurements into a denominator that matches this, a common denominator. So pi over 2 is the same thing as 2 pi over 4. Pi is the same thing as 4 pi over 4. And 3 pi over 2 is the same as 6 pi over 4. That allows me to see that if I want 3 pi over 4, it has to be somewhere between 2 pi over 4 and 4 pi over 4. So this is going to be in quadrant 2. Specifically, pi over, pi over 4 less than all the way out to pi. So 3 pi over 4 is 3 pi over 4, with 1 pi over 4 remaining. This will become our reference angle later, so this is actually super important to find every time. Our next one that we're going to do is 7 pi over 6. Again, change all of the radian measurements for the x and y axis into the same denominator. So 0 divided by 6 is still 0. We have 3 pi over 6, we have 6 pi over 6, and we have 9 pi over 6. Well, 7 pi over 6 is just a pi over 6, 1 pi over 6 beyond 180 degrees, beyond pi. So this green angle is 7 pi over 6, given that this amount right here is just pi over 6. One more pi over 6 more than 180 degrees or pi. Another piece of vocabulary for us is coterminal angles. These are angles that have the same terminal angle, which is why it's called coterminal angles, meaning that one may go a positive direction, alpha, and end here at this ray, 
and another angle may go the opposite direction, still ending at that ray, but it's just a different angle measurement beta. Since, since these both end at the same ray, at the same particular side, they're called coterminal angles, alpha and beta. One of them is positive, one of them is negative. But what's cool is we can also find two positive coterminal angles. Like let's say this little guy right here, that's just alpha. And we also wanted to go that same direction, that positive direction, and end at the same spot. We can do a full 360, a full 2 pi, and then keep going this little bit of distance to meet back up at the same ray. These are coterminal because they have the same ending ray and the same ending side. So if we wanted to find coterminal angles, one positive, one negative, let's say for 30 degrees, we would need to go one direction and then the other direction. So we know this is 30 degrees, that's the given. So a coterminal angle, if we go positive first, would be completing a full revolution, 360, and going a little bit further, 30 degrees more. So that's 360 plus 30 for 390 degrees. We can also go the opposite direction, starting negatively, and we would want to end at the same angle. So that's 30 degrees less than 260 in the negative direction, or 60 degrees past negative 270. However you see it, this would be negative 330 degrees. We can do the same thing in radians. If we wanted to find two coterminal angles for 2 pi over 3, first thing we need to do is graph 2 pi over 3. So here's 2 pi over 3. It's essentially 120 degrees for those of you thinking in degree measurements. And so if we wanted to go the positive direction, we'd have to go a full 2 pi revolution and then an additional 2 pi over 3. So 2 pi plus 2 pi over 3, which if we give them common denominators, we can actually add them, is 6 pi over 3 plus 2 pi over 3. That's 8 pi over 3. That's one of my coterminal angles. And then if I wanted to go the negative direction, this is negative 2 pi over, or pi over 2. This is negative pi. Then I have just a little bit more, specifically a pi over 3 more to keep going. So I have negative pi minus pi over 3, which giving them a common denominator, negative 4 pi over 3 is a coterminal angle with 2 pi over 3. They end at the same spot. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the trigonometry that we learned, the opposite over adjacent, the A over B, all of those things that we learned, and we're going to put them on a coordinate plane. Because in trigonometry, we're going to be able to create coordinates on our coordinate plane in a circular motion that allow us to define the trig in terms of x, y, and the radius. So we're going to change everything. Anytime you're given an opposite term, that's actually the distance y for this point. And every time you're given an adjacent angle, that's the measurement x, because it's side to side from this reference angle. Your hypotenuse is the radius of the circle, because if this were along one particular circle, the radius would be the same everywhere, and x and y would change as you go around, which is pretty cool. It allows us to do a lot of trig. So this is probably um, the most important slide you're going to see, and since it's all written on here, it's a little overwhelming, so just hang on with me a little bit. This was the same picture in green, red, and blue that we had on the other page. You have your radius meeting the circle at some point x comma y. Well, that x is the distance for the adjacent side. And the y is the length of the opposite side. And your radius is your hypotenuse. So all of our trig measurements can be rewritten in terms of x, y, and r. So sine is y divided by r, cosine is x divided by r, and tangent is y divided by x, whatever those measurements are for that coordinate point on the circle. Cosecant and secant and cotangent are just the reciprocals of the function that it matches with. So cosecant is r divided by y, secant is r divided by x, and cotangent is y divided by, or sorry, x divided by y, just the reciprocals of them. Now what's so important about this is that 
you need to know the positivity of these different signs. Before today, we've been doing all of our trig in quadrant one. And so this didn't really matter because in fact, in quadrant one, all of your signs, all of sine, cosine, and tangent, and the reciprocals are positive. But in other quadrants, they're not all positive. In quadrant two, only sine and its reciprocal is positive. In quadrant three, only tangent and its reciprocal are positive. In quadrant four, only cosine and its reciprocal are, pro are positive. So the way that we're going to remember this is with the phrase, because this is an all-star trig class. Go in the order of the quadrants, all-star trig class, all-star trig class. It's going to tell us which of the signs or which of the functions are positive. So all of the functions are positive, sine is positive, tangent is positive, cosine is positive. Now that's going to be super important because what we're going to be doing is looking at trig in some of the other quadrants and we can use reference angles and all-star trig class to be able to determine what the trig of these angles are. So for example, we're going to look at all six trigonometric ratios whose terminal side passes through this given point. Remember, when I'm given x and y now, I'm given the horizontal and the vertical distance from the center origin to the coordinate point. That's the side lengths of my triangle, like you see right here. And once you have the side lengths of those triangles, you very easily, if you're not given the radius, can use Pythagorean theorem to find it. So we use Pythagorean theorem. I've already derived this for r. This is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, just rewritten with x's, y's, and the radius. And so when I plug in what I know, which is x and y, I know that the radius is 5. All I need to find all of the trig measures, now that we've put it on a coordinate plane, I need to know what x is, I need to know what y is, and I need to know what r is. Once I have those three things, I'm really good to go. I can start doing all of my trig. Since this is quadrant one, quadrant one is A for all star trig class. So all of these functions are going to be positive. So we're going to go ahead, and I always put like plus or minus in front of it just because I need the reminder of when things are positive and negative. But notice that when I do all of my trig, just like normal, they're all positive numbers. Now when I do a problem like this, where I have x and y, notice that now that coordinate point is in quadrant 4. That's the c in all star trig class, which means cosine and secant are going to be positive, but everything else is going to be negative. So cosine and its reciprocal and its inverse are positive in quadrant 4. Everything else is negative. So you can go ahead and list that out for yourself. But we're going to do the same thing here. We have x and y, which means I can very easily solve for r. r would be, using Pythagorean theorem, square root of 34. And then I have x, I have y, I have r. And I'm able to do all of the trig measures, just making sure that I give everything a negative unless it's cosine and secant because we're in quadrant 4. Now, all of this kind of combines together to allow us to do trig for any function in any particular quadrant because we're going to combine the idea of reference angles and those angle measurements on a circle with what we now know about positivity in different quadrants. So if you look at 315 degrees, that would be 90, 180, 270, 315. 315 is going to be in quadrant 4. But knowing that's where 315 is means that there's about 45 degrees left, exactly 45 degrees left to finish this entire circle. I've now made what's called a reference triangle or a reference angle. That's a 45, 45, 90 triangle here. I can do all of my trig using the hand trick with sine, cosine, and tangent with that 45 to be able to tell you all the trig for 315. So we can simplify these problems down knowing what their reference angle is 
and then taking into account that this is quadrant four, and in quadrant four, cosine and its reciprocal are positive and everything else is negative. So let's look at an example of this. Here's the steps that you would need to take to do this. I'm not gonna to spend too long on this slide because you can read it, but we're gonna draw the angle in standard position. So we're gonna figure out where the angle goes. We're gonna find a reference angle. So once we know where that angle goes, we're gonna create a reference triangle and know what that theta is in there. If it's 30, 60, 90, or 45, 45, 90, which most of them will be, we'll be able to use our hand trick to be able to tell the exact values or if it's not, if it's any other reference angle, you'll have to use your calculator. And last but not least, before you give me a final answer, you need to double check and make sure you know positivity, all star trig class, for which one is positive. Okay, so, so check this out. If we were doing the sine of negative 210, that's the only thing I wanna know is sine of negative 210. First things first, draw the angle. Here's negative 210. We did this one earlier, which is why I'm just kind of blowing through this. We did negative 210 a couple slides back. Negative 210 is here, which is 30 degrees past 180. Okay, this has now made a reference triangle for me. A 30, 60, 90 triangle. In quadrant two. In quadrant two, sine is positive. So really, instead of doing the sine of negative 210, I can use the idea of positivity and this reference angle to do the sine of 30 and get 1 half. Guys, the sine of negative 210 is 1 half. We find that by doing sine of 30. When I'm doing tangent of 5 pi over 3, First things first, I need some common denominators in all of my references so that I know what I'm talking about here. So I'm going to use the denominator of 6 so that pi over 2 can be written as over 6. So this would be pi over 2, but with a denominator of 6, that's 3 pi over 2. This would be pi or 6 pi over 6. And then this one down here, 3 pi over 2, is 9 pi over 6. And then we get back to 0 or 2 pi which I guess is 12 pi over 6, if we're being particular. So 10 pi over 6 is a pi over 6, 1 pi over 6 beyond 10 or 9 pi over 6. So we've got this as my angle. 5 pi over 3 is all the way here. And if this is pi over 6 more than 9 pi over 6, that means I have a pi over 3 remaining. So this right here is a 30 degrees even though it doesn't really look like it. And this is 60 degrees, even though it doesn't really look like it. So this has created my reference triangle, my reference angle here. This is what I want to use to do the trig because I know the trig of something in quadrant one and something that's pi over three way easier than five pi over three. Couple things to remember, since we are in quadrant four, cosine is the only thing that's positive. So tangent is going to be negative. And so if I'm doing tangent of 5 pi over 3, it's the same thing as negative tangent of pi over 3. So I can use my hand to figure out what this is. If I put down the 60 finger, or the pi over 3 finger, I have 3 underneath and 1 above. So tangent of 5 pi over 3 is like the negative tangent of pi over 3, which is negative square root of 3. Remember, it's negative because we're in quadrant 4 to do this tangent, and cosine is the only thing that's positive in this quadrant. I know that this stuff is wild, but we will get it. Uh, the last example that I'm going to talk through on this notes is this one. Given the values of, find the values of the six trig functions with the given constraints. We are told only that the sine of theta is 3 over 7 and that tangent of theta is negative, less than 0. Well, this right here told me y and r, because sine is y divided by r. So in my picture that I'm drawing, I have my y, I have r. I would just need to figure out what x is. And so that's a really quick Pythagorean theorem to find that x is 2 square root of 10. Bloop. Now I have x, y, and r. Now, 
if sine is positive, and sine is positive because like this is a positive number. If sine is positive and tangent is negative, then that means we have to be in quadrant two because all of them are positive here, so tangent is not negative. Sine is the only thing that's positive here. So sine is positive and tangent is negative if we're in quadrant one, which means that everything but sine and cosecant are going to be negative. And after that, I just have to do the regular trig functions of cosine is x divided by r, tangent is y divided by x, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, secant is the reciprocal of cosine, and cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. Okay, I just lied to you. I will talk through this example. I know I said I wouldn't. But in this one, it says find the, give, the values of the six trig functions with the given constraints. We're told that secant of theta is 3, which remembers 3 over 1. And secant, by our definition, is r divided by x, because it's the inverse of cosine. So we have the radius, and we have x. We have the radius, we have x. Now we're going to be able to find the y value with a little bit of Pythagorean theorem. And we just have to know positivity at this point. If secant is positive, that means cosine is positive. And the other constraint we're told is that sine of theta is greater than zero, or sine is also positive. So if cosine is positive and sine is positive, the only quadrant where that happens is quadrant one. So that means all of my trig functions are going to be positive. Great. Now I just use the definitions. Sine is y divided by r. Cosine is x divided by r. Tangent is y divided by 1, which is, sorry, y divided by x. Cosecant is r divided by y. Secant is r divided by x. Cotangent is x divided by y. So again, we just needed though those relationships from that one side I said was super important and the positivity of all star trig class to be able to talk about trig for any function. Know your reference angles, know your reference triangles, know the positivity, and know the hand trick.